Great, thank you. And what an honor to be part of a trilateral uh, event like this. And obviously, one of the things uh, that has changed uh, dramatically since the 2015 nuclear deal that's self-evident in this entire webinar, but uh, unspoken, uh, is the Abraham Accords uh, and the changing uh, dynamic of the region that that nuclear deal brought uh, the Arabs and Israelis together. Uh, and that now we hear the Middle East outside of Iran speak with one voice to Washington. Uh, not uh, not squabbles, uh, not questions of what the threat of the region is. And it's something that plays a dynamic in what I'll talk about. The American perspective uh, on JCPOA and on where we're at here is not so simple uh, to say, this is what the Biden administration thinks and this is the opponents. The American government, uh, the system of government with a divided uh, system of government between the White House and Congress, and also a federal system of Washington and state governments uh, means that you have to really uh, look three-dimensionally at the American perspective to understand what will US policy be going forward and what will the impact be on Iran no matter the conclusion from the Biden administration. If I put myself in the shoes of, of some of the people inside uh, the senior uh, areas of the Biden White House and State Department and give you their argument for a moment uh, before I, I shift to Congress uh, for a more critical view, I would say that they look at uh, the maximum pressure campaign as a failure uh, because, first of all, they're quite wedded to the JCPOA. Almost all of these officials were in the Obama administration and helped negotiate the deal. And so emotionally, if you uh, cement the deal and you believe in the deal and you sell the deal, uh, then you will always believe that you were right. Uh, it's very difficult to look back in time and say this was flawed. We made mistakes. We shouldn't go back to it. And the dynamic of the polarization in the United States of anything that Trump did uh, reflexively being bad uh, in the view of most Democrats adds to this. And so the idea that the Trump administration, that President Trump left the Iran nuclear deal already creates a massive uh, partisan backlash uh, that obviously this was the wrong decision. And look, everything that everyone has talked about on this uh, webinar to date means that the Iranian nuclear program is more advanced and more dangerous and more threatening than it was before Trump left the nuclear deal, which means that uh, for the most important of all the threats that we talk about of Iran, uh, the maximum pressure campaign has failed on the merits, at least to date. Uh, then we have to say, okay, what is the most important national security priority facing the United States? Uh, it is in the view of the president today, limiting uh, Iran's nuclear enrichment. It is, they call it putting Iran back in the box. Now, the question, of course, of, well, what about all these undeclared nuclear sites and activities that we're starting to hear about from the IAEA? Where is the material? Where are the sites? Where is the equipment? What's going on with this nuclear archive we discovered in the interim? Uh, they simply believe uh, that this is historical in nature, uh, that uh, there, there may be elements there that we need to learn from. We need to press the Iranians on it. But that does not have to come at the expense of limiting the declared enrichment at declared sites of Iran, which is, at least in their view and in the intelligence community assessment to date publicly, uh, the most uh, poignant threat opposed by Iran's nuclear program. We can continue to talk about the archive and other issues on a different track, uh, so long as we get uh, Iran's nuclear program back in a box. Now, what about the idea that we would be handing over billions of dollars again for Iranian terrorism and missile development uh, and other malign activities Again, they would say, as the president told Tom Friedman uh, back at the beginning during transition in his early presidency in his interview, there is nothing more important to him of all the threats than the nuclear program. Everything else takes a back seat. There was terrorism before the JCPOA, there was terrorism during the JCPOA, and there was terrorism after the JCPOA. What concerns U.S. national security the most is putting this nuclear program in a box. And so that is their uh, highest uh, regard which is why you hear latest reports they are willing to lift terrorism sanctions and effectively subsidize the IRGC, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps' budget, if in exchange Iran does agree uh, to get rid of some of its enriched uranium stockpile and reduce the level of its enrichment. That it views as a good deal for U.S. national security. And then you come to the point of, well, what about the missiles? As Ali pointed out at the beginning, uh, what about the fact that these are nuclear capable missiles? These are the delivery systems for nuclear weapons, and you're allowing them to continue development on challenge with a larger budget. 
you come back to the initial question that would have faced uh, the same team under the Obama administration in 2015, why did you agree to this deal that did not cover missiles and other issues? Why did you agree to this deal with sunset provisions? And they would say, well, we know that once we are in this deal and we have concluded and we have shown the Iranians that there are benefits to doing a deal with the West, there are economic benefits to not having threatening programs, then we will be able to come to them and negotiate a follow-on agreement. So the same criticism that's leveled today of your nearing sunset agreements, some have already come and gone, others uh, are, are nearer in the future, and also you're still not addressing missiles. They would point back to papers like Robert Einhorn, uh, who was an Obama administration official, also a Clinton administration official who worked on the agreed framework on North Korea back in the 1990s, and look at what JCPOA 2.0 should look like. What more can we offer the Iranians on top of the money we've provided under the JCPOA to encourage them to adopt similar type limits on their missile program, where again, you don't have true dismantlement, you don't have irreversible uh, commitments, uh, but they would limit uh, certain uh, parts of their arsenal. They wouldn't test certain parts of their arsenal for additional benefits. They call this idea more for more. Now, that's where the Biden administration sits today. There are some uh, in their camp, uh, particularly the special envoy for Iran, uh, Robert Malley, uh, who ideologically, based on his past statements uh, and writings, truly believes ideologically in the JCPOA as a bridge towards Iranian moderation, that Iran does not have to be an enemy of the United States, that it could be a potential partner in the region, that we have common threats, common interests, and if we can uh, get some of the past issues going back to 1953 out of the way, uh, we can clear the air and move forward. That a lot of these issues of terrorism, quote unquote, uh, and missile development are not irrational. They are quite rational based on how Iran, the Islamic Republic, sees the region, and that this is largely a regional conflict that the United States shouldn't be taking sides in. That if we can contain the nuclear program, the true threat to the United States, uh, then we can convene regional actors to talk about regional issues that would include missiles and what the United States labels as terrorism. There are others uh, that are more pragmatic, uh, who don't view Iran that way, who do believe that Iran is an evil state sponsor of terrorism, uh, but they also uh, say that we have a lot of things going on in the world today, China, Russia, uh, other issues we need to deal with. We don't want to have a nuclear crisis with Iran in the first 100 days of this presidency. We will get to other issues later with Iran. We don't need to have a war right now. We don't need to have a crisis right now. We want to get on to other issues on the president's agenda. And of course, we still have the coronavirus. We have domestic issues like an infrastructure bill the president's putting forward. Get this off the front burner. We still have a couple more years till the worst sunsets come. Let's kick the can down the road by essentially paying Iran's extortion racket and giving us more time to focus on other issues here at home. That is absolutely a view of some inside the Biden White House. It's not ideological about the JCPOA. It's pragmatic of, I don't wanna work on this today. What will it cost to get it off the front burner? Now in the Congress, people say, wow, this was a bad deal that we opposed back in 2015. You never submitted it to us, to the United States Senate as a treaty. This is a political agreement, which means just as the world saw in 2018, if you just go along with sanctions relief provided by one president under this non-binding political agreement called the JCPOA, and you go back into Iran and you try to reinvest and, and take advantage of sanctions relief, if a Republican president uh, comes back into the White House or if Republicans take control of Congress, the House and Senate in the next midterm election, you could be in for a great big awakening just like you were in 2018. And so you're seeing massive numbers of Republicans in the House and Senate putting forward a series of legislative packages that mirror the maximum pressure campaign as it has been, that we should not be lifting any sanctions on Iran until Iran agrees to curb all of its malign activities, not just temporary narrow limits on its nuclear program. That is a message to the market, not just to the Biden administration, of beware. We may take back to Congress and send something that is very politically difficult for President Biden to veto in two years, or we may take back the White House with any number of these senators uh, or former officials uh, who are for maximum pressure and against the JCPOA. And so sanctions will be back, it's just a matter of when, 
And that will probably dampen any benefits Iran gets, even if sanctions relief is granted by the Biden administration. One other piece of this puzzle that Congress views uh, very, very problematically, and that is the issue of terrorism sanctions and missile sanctions on Iran. This is something that probably is the most worrisome of the changing dynamic that Yosu talked about of the Biden administration's uh, policy negotiating posture at the table in Vienna. Early on in this administration, Tony Blinken, uh, when he was up for confirmation as Secretary of State, was asked point blank by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, will you keep terrorism sanctions on Iran, sanctions on the central bank, on its oil company, sectors of Iran that are tied to terrorism specifically by the US Treasury Department? And he said it is not in the interest of the United States to lift those sanctions and that those sanctions are not inconsistent with the JCPOA. That is a view that he also declared during the 2020 presidential campaign, during an interview with an outlet called the Jewish Insider, in which he vowed that no matter what the Biden administration would do on the JCPOA, they would keep all non-nuclear sanctions in place. And indeed, that is the policy of the Obama White House when they told the American people what the JCPOA was and what it was not. They said, and it's in writing, the United States would always be allowed to impose non-nuclear sanctions after agreeing to the initial sanctions relief from JCPOA. They specifically mentioned the authority to use terrorism sanctions under a specific executive order that the Trump administration then used to designate a number of entities throughout Iran due to their support for the IRGC. Why did this all happen uh, during the Trump administration's time in office? It was not to prevent and make it more difficult to go back to JCPOA, as you're hearing the Biden administration uh, claim to try to justify why they're going to lift these terrorism sanctions now, caving to Iranian demands. In fact, it was Congress on a bipartisan basis in 2017, while Trump was still in the JCPOA, that passed a big counter IRGC law, sanctions law, that mandated the president to impose sanctions on all affiliates of the IRGC. That bill had actually passed the Senate almost unanimously on its own as an Iran sanctions bill, and then was put into a larger sanctions package along with Russia sanctions, a bill called CATSA, people may remember in 2017, and then signed by the president. Almost unanimous, Democrats and Republicans during the nuclear deal imposing additional sanctions on Iran outside its nuclear program. And so we fast forward to today and Congress is saying, wow, we were told that you could always have terrorism and missile sanctions on Iran, no matter what we did with JCPOA. And now the Biden administration is changing that position of the United States interpretation and saying, no, if there are terrorism sanctions or missile sanctions on entities for which we originally promised sanctions relief, we are not allowed to have those sanctions in place anymore. We must lift those sanctions. That is going to be a big problem for Congress if that indeed happens. And so we'll see the legislative push could be bipartisan, could be an amendment to a must pass piece of legislation. That might be a showdown we see over terrorism and missile sanctions later this year. Two more points and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, one more piece, American hostages. Uh, there is a huge number of people in the Congress uh, who have constituents who have been touched uh, by not just American terrorism, but American hostage taking as well. There's been no word that any American hostages will be freed as part of lifting sanctions. And indeed, there is a large swell of members of Congress who believe that no sanctions relief should be provided until American uh, hostages are all released. There are other citizens of other countries as well who are unjustifiably detained in Iran. That is not apparently on the table. Uh, as Congress looks forward uh, again, uh, there will be opportunities to legislate, but also opportunities for governors and mayors and state legislatures to legislate. One of the interesting things we forget about because it was so long ago is in the 2000s, there was a movement to divest public pension funds from companies that invested in Iran's energy sector in the states and local governments. And over half the states of the union adopted these measures. Some went beyond that to insurance sanctions and financial sanctions. Those are still on the books largely. And in fact, it worries the Iranians greatly. They mentioned it in the JCPOA, that it was incumbent on the United States at the federal level to take all possible steps to prevent those state and local actions from interfering with sanctions relief. It is possible in this polarized environment that red states could adopt additional measures. 
that indeed would interfere with international banks and companies uh, trying to get back into Iran on top of the threat of a Republican takeover of Congress or a return uh, to the White House. So the picture here is unfortunate on the federal level. It does look like the executive branch uh, will be moving towards rejoining the JCPOA without any uh, hope of a longer agreement, without any improvements to that agreement, without any uh, justification or accountability for the undeclared nuclear activities uh, currently in Iran, without any American hostages uh, being released, and giving up America's position that we are allowed to impose terrorism and missile sanctions, regardless of the initial sanctions relief provided under JCPOA. You will have a backlash from some in Congress, certainly from a unified Republican position, possibly on some of those issues like terrorism, missiles, or hostages, a bipartisan coalition to emerge. And you'll also have to see what happens on the local level uh, from states uh, and cities throughout the country. Richard, if I can just follow up with a, with a question. Some people say, okay, maybe the best thing was not to leave the JCPOA in the first place uh, or leave it under the snapback uh, option. Uh, because today we are not going back to the JCPOA, uh, in fact, but we are going to, uh, not back, we are going to a worse version, uh, or worse version of the JCPOA. As, as somebody who worked for the Trump administration, uh, what do you say about this claim? Yeah, I mean, listen, amazingly, uh, President Biden inherited more leverage than Congress gave President Obama when you compare 2021 to 2013, right? So 2013 is really the year to talk about, not 2015 when we talked about the conclusion of JCPOA, 2013 and the entry to the interim deal JPOA. That's when America gave up its leverage, right? It was a fait accompli at that point of dancing around the details. But America lifted many of its sanctions and gave Iran pause of, of sanctions pressure in 2013 in exchange for certain uh, limited nuclear concessions that let, then led to the full JCPOA. If you go back to 2013, the central bank of Iran under sanctions, but not all of its oil exports, right? The price of oil was over $100 a barrel. A lot of political risk uh, in the US to try to drive Iranian oil exports to zero at that time. And so we didn't do that. We left them around a, a million or more barrels per day on the market. Uh, we had not closed off several other sectors of the economy, and we certainly didn't go after the entirety of its financial sector back then. Uh, a report in October of 2013, put out by FDD and Rubini uh, Economics at the time, uh, said that we believed Iran was down to $20 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves and that it would be able to muddle along for at least another year. So we were not at the maximized pressure point. Flash forward to today, we've just learned while these talks are going on in Vienna, and while there's a setback to its nuclear program at the times, that the IMF reports an updated number. By the end of 2020, Iran was down to $4 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves. That is unbelievable success of maximum pressure. And the trajectory, if you look at the pace of Iran's burning through cash towards the end of 2020, meant that if the psychology had remained in place, that sanctions were going to be staying and coming on more and more, that was a regime in serious, serious crisis. $120 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves in 2018, down to $12 billion at the end of 2019, down to $9 billion by fall of 2020, down to $4 billion by the end of 2020. The burn rate was accelerating. The Iranians had finally not been able to cope with the maximum pressure campaign. And that's why you saw the tanker get seized from the South Koreans in the Gulf, attacks in Iraq. They were flailing very early on in the Biden administration to get attention very quickly and try to force exactly what they forced in Vienna because the maximum pressure campaign was so close to being successful. We had already drained their accounts of the IRGC and their missile program, their defense budget, which by the way, is good for US national security and good for the region on its own merits. The rest was propaganda. The rest was a Potemkin village to scare the Americans into sanctions relief. And unfortunately, the propaganda, the Potemkin village worked at the worst possible time. And so it looks like today, Biden inherited more pressure and leverage than Obama had, and he is going to give up more 
than Obama gave up in JCPOA. That is an amazing thing to think about.